Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the webinar here that was put together in quick order. I uh, wanted to talk about a lot of recent news uh, flying around from EB5. And uh, I am sitting here uh, with our other host, uh, as you guys probably have all known and seen and talked to, uh, Peter Bibbler, our managing director, Baron Capital, and then Greg Sheehan, uh, our in house EB5 USBI, USCIS whisperer, former adjudicator. Both of them uh, esteemed EB5 experts and immigration attorneys as well. Uh, and then I'm Colin Baring, the CEO of Baring Regional Center, Baring Capital. And uh, today uh, is really all talking about uh, the filing statistics and the new data that had come out uh, thanks to Matt Galati and his litigation expertise uh, and the good work that he's been doing for multiple, multiple years. Uh, Matt strikes again. Um, and it was on behalf of AIIA, uh, the uh, nonprofit group trying to represent uh, EB-5 investors. Uh, everybody did good work uncovering these statistics, uh, but there's a lot more work to be done in knowing where we are and where we're going and what it all means. And that was the item that we wanted to solve today with this webinar is to, to really kind of break down, get through the noise, get through any of the distractions and get past the sales pitches and you know even defamation in some cases and wanting to get to what does it mean to me the investor if you're filing today and you're making a new choice what do you do that's the purpose of today's work so in the agenda uh we're going to talk about the the i-5260 inventory analysis demand trends. We'll talk about what it means for you as EB-5 investors. Then at the end of this, I'm going to talk about like what I would do, given what we know, Peter, Greg, and I, we've been in this industry for over a decade, some even longer, real estate experts, been in the development world for darn near 20 years already. I would tell you what I would do overall in this kind of situation. So then we can, at the end, we'll talk about really the key to all this is focusing on the next legislative cycle, because that'll be even more impactful as we go. But to move very quickly uh, through what everybody kind of already knows and is probably already reviewed on their own, we'll try to just get more to the analysis and the Q&A more than anything. But again, thanks to Matt Galati, uh, thanks to the people that have made the effort to go and do this. Uh, it's a big deal and it should be recognized by the industry. Um, we'll talk again, like we're, we're getting into what these numbers mean. What does it tell us? What, what is, what, what does the data mean? And then also what does it not mean? And what is it being misrepresented to say? And that's even almost as important as what it does. Say. So we all know that anyone that's from a high volume country is worried about backlogs. The visa bulletin is current. The worst of us in the EB-5 industry will say, hey, it's current, there's no backlog. It's simple to say and it's simple to point at and try to convince you that, yeah, okay, yeah, Visa Bulletin's current, no backlog, great. But filing stats come out and anybody that knows anything about the statistics that were unveiled is that, hey, okay, there's a per country quota limit for all of this and that's these numbers. If you break it all down, you talk about the 10,000 visas for the entire program all year, 7% limit across the board for each country, break it down by derivatives, you end up with like 56 investors in the reserve set aside for rural, 28 investors for uh, HUA, and that's based off of you know 2.5 visas per investor. It's not a big number. So you know, when you put that all together, 56 and 28, but then you've got a couple hundred filings across all categories from lots of countries. There's a backlog. But those people telling you there is no backlog in the visa bulletin, obviously that's not real. But then that's when, before you get really disappointed about backlogs and oversubscriptions and potential delay, this is actually really where it starts to get really messy. Um, and you know we, we've got a couple charts here, but rural HUA they have their quota limits, and that's this little number here on the left: 56, 57 investors, 28 investors. It's not very many. And when you get to filing numbers that look like this for HUA rural, there's 
everybody is way oversubscribed. You have you have a lot of visas asking for these little numbers, but then the real math needs to start, and that's the carryovers, the wastage in these other things. And that calculation is extremely complex to really put into a real trajectory on who's going to get what and when. And that's why we need Peter and Greg. So Peter, why don't you take us through, or Greg, both of you guys, how do we really do math besides I-5260 filings that we know about? Yeah, there's a, I mean, just to get us started, um, we what we do know is that there's been significant demand since the RIA uh, really took effect and people were allowed to start filing uh, in August of, of 2022. And um, the initial, uh, the Macalotti and the AIA group uh, in, with their initial FOIA showed that, you know, high demand early, uh, early in the process of, for HUA, uh, high unemployment numbers. And then more recently, we've seen a, a, a rapid uptick in rural filings. Part of that is um, just the, the normal trajectory of history. Like uh, when, when these, this, the RIA first got started, most of the projects were already pre-approved or already structured to, to take investors, ready investors were, were um, high unemployment projects. Uh, uh, over these past several months, uh, I think more and more rural projects have, have come online and um, and and we're seeing that in the latest uh, FOIA release, data release, we're seeing uh, a rapid uh, increase in rural filings. And so we'll talk about the implications of, of that um, going forward. But so we, we know that there's, uh, we know that there's demand and we know that there's a, a significant number of filings. Um, what we, what, there's many things that we don't know, and and this is where it's hard to make uh, firm predictions uh, yeah, on the future and how long it's going to take to get a green card if you file through uh, a, a high unemployment urban project versus uh, a rural project. And um, if someone is, is giving you, trying to give you certainty, then they're probably selling something and trying to hide something else. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the message today is that really just to raise awareness and 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 emphasize that there are no shortcuts uh, in in EB five investment. And we'll talk about you know things that you should be considering uh, big picture, taking a more holistic approach to this. Um, we know the number of filings to date, uh, at least through probably October twenty twenty three. Beyond that, um, uh, AIA, Macalotti, Suzanne Lazicki at, at uh, Lisa Tech's blog, um, you know, I've indicated that uh, uh, some of the numbers kind of drop off and the, and the uh, credibility of the data kind of drop off after November. Um, there's, there's a reasons for that. There's a lag between the time that you're filing, it goes to the lockbox and it actually gets processed. And so that's why some of you uh, maybe on the call today that have already filed, May have not gotten the, your I-797 uh, notice of action with your priority date and your your file number, so there is some type of lag. You have actually people responding to this FOIA request by counting counting boxes, and 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 so there's there's that. The other issue too is that um, the the numbers are already out of date, so that's just the in that unavoidable uh, nature of FOIA requests. They have 30, it's, it's effective as of the date of the request that you make. And USCIS has 20 to 30 days to, to respond. And then you have to file a lawsuit because they won't do it uh, voluntarily. So that's why Galati, uh, you know, uh, attorney Macalotti needs to, to, to enforce the FOIA request through a lawsuit. And so that's why you have a, a, you know, already a four or five month delay um, between the data that we do have and where we are now. So we have to do the best we can uh, with what we have. There are other things that, uh, that we have to guess, um, processing times. Uh, and that's gonna be the key message today, uh, that and, and the visa waste, uh, because if and when there are visa backlogs or visa retrogression will depend primarily on how quickly USCIS 
processes and approves I-526 petitions and how quickly then once you once that begins that your file is sent to NBC uh, to start the visa application process or that your file is sent for the to the processing center for your I-45 adjustment status approval and how long that takes to go through that green card phase. Um, yeah, uh, Charlie Oppenheim, former State uh, Department uh, Chief of Visa Control, who, who basically handled all of this for 20, 20 plus years, um, you know, indicated that you're, after approval, you really need to have your approvals done by, by the end of uh, Q1 in order for, generally, historically speaking, for your visas to be approved within that same fiscal year to use, that, to use those visa numbers. So there could be a lag in that regard. How many visas per per family? Um, how many visas per I-526 application uh, to, to indicate how many visa numbers are going to be allocated per filing that we see on this FOIA request? And then there are natural withdrawal rates and denial rates. Um, this is important too because there have been a significant number of withdrawals uh, historically in the unreserved visa category that could have uh, future ramifications on backlogs and such. Um, uh, and there has been an uptick in denials uh, uh, of recent late, uh, uh, of recent periods, and that's where it's important to work with quality counsel, experienced counsel, counsel that uh, immigration attorneys that have, you know, filed thousands of cases, hundreds of cases, not not dozens of cases, and and are very familiar with with that approach. I think some of the denials of of recent um, of, of of recent period have been a largely due to withdrawals uh, from pre-RIA investors. Mm -hmm. And uh, because those are counted as denials uh, by USCIS in their database as they do the reporting. And um, probably shabby uh, uh, petitions being filed in the race of the $500,000 window before the RIA was, was passed in, in March, uh, 2020, 22. Um, and then, the other unknowns that we're going to get to and, and discuss here in the next couple of slides uh, will be about um, uh, country caps and carryovers and and how that can play a role uh, over these next uh, two fiscal years about uh, visa demand and visa supply and whether or not and when uh, retrogression will take place. Greg, do you want to carry us off here on, on the carryovers here? Sure. Yeah, that's a good way to get started. And so after working at the Immigrant Investor Program Office, I, I learned that there's a financial motivation to execute production. And that means you want to give people faith in the program to be able to file, especially when you're asking for way more starting April than you have in the past. You want to maximize visa use and try to forestall a final action date um, being placed because every new filing that you get gives a new family an opportunity to get a five-year EAD, advanced parole documents, uh, child status protection if you're in the United States and filing. And so if you look at USCIS and where they've been and where they are now and where they are going forward, they're trying to be set up to make money and use as many visas as possible. In this year, there's 23,000 visas available. And this is a bit unusual where Congress allowed for extra visas, there's some carryover from um, unused supply in the family-based category, and there's a, a, just a, a quick flyover. Um, some of this inventory is subject to being lost. And if we go to this slide, um, and this information I grabbed from um, a webinar put together by Charlie Oppenheim and Joey Barnett, who are just really great assets for the EB-5 community. Um, check out their monthly chatting with Charlie series. Uh, we've worked with them before and done some video. Um, this is a WR immigration or Wolfsdorf, uh, Rosenthal. Yeah. Um, if you were to look at the yellow highlighted number, fiscal year 2024, this represents a number of visas that will be lost if they're not used this year. And they are part of the unreserved um, inventory. And so in order to use those, you are going to typically provide visas from the unreserved visa demand. But a little bit of a, I don't want to say bombshell, I'm hesitant to use that word, but a suggestion that I've made 
personally to IPO via email through the proper channels is that they should be using reserved requests for visas um, and then giving them the visa from the unreserved inventory that are subject to being wasted. And we found out recently, we have evidence that a rural application from a rest of the world applicant was serviced with an unreserved visa. So that delimits to an extent the number of visas that are going to be put into the, the lower supply of 20 and 10% collectively for the reserve categories. And that allows USCIS to preserve that visa, to get it used, and to essentially limit some of the demand that everybody says, oh, there's 20% and 10%. Well, if this continues, you have access to more than 10% and 20%, which is a seemingly big number in a year of 23,000. And when you're forecasting waste, they're showing us that they're taking the best path forward for visa maximization. Okay, so for, for quick translations, there's two items that Greg and his federal government insight is trying to tell us. One, USCIS wants to issue as many visas as possible to collect fees. They want your money. Mm -hmm. They're financially motivated is what Greg was saying, which means they want your money, which they have to get visas out. They have to get people filing. They cannot have huge backlogs where demand goes to nothing. They need to fund themselves and pay their own salaries through fees. And to do that, they need to do work. So we've seen USCIS ramp up approvals and they are throwing out approvals and green cards like candy right now in batch processing. They are moving. But what they're also doing, what Greg is saying, is this big column in the rest of world for HUA right now, it looks like 600 filings or something like that. They are feeding that entire demand out of the unreserved category with a couple cases. It's not a it's not a law, it's not a regulation, it's not a policy, but we're seeing it happen in practice. That's what we're saying. Yeah, so, and it's a game changer if you continue. When, when um, it, for and and some and maybe even some folks on the on the call today, but when your when your I five two sixty petition is approved, what we have seen is that uh, whether you're filing a five two six petition through a rural project or a, a high unemployment area project. Uh, when that is approved, you're getting a dual visa approval code, meaning you're getting a uh, reserved rule visa approval code and a reserved unreserved rule visa code. And the same applies for high unemployment. You're getting an unreserved uh, HUA code and, you're, uh, and a reserved HUA code. And what, what we've seen here, Greg uh, has learned, is that um, for recently, a person from not uh, you know from not China, not India, not the high demand traditional high demand countries uh, had a their I five two six petition I five two six e petition through a rural project approved, and then when the I forty five visa I forty five adjustment of status was approved, uh, even though they were filed in a reserved project reserved rural project, they were given allocated uh, an unreserved uh, green card. So that what that does is that it it lowers the reserved rest of world demand of reserve visas yeah. and frees that up for India and China, the traditionally high demand uh, uh, countries. It frees up more reserve visas in that fiscal year for high demand countries. This is reducing the risks of future backlogs. And it's significant because what it means is that if we have a lot of people filing in these categories based off of information that they know. And you've got, you know, the reserve set asides, you got people that thought there's priority. They, they, there's all these rules in the end, none of the rules matter because the day they issued an actual green card against the category, they pulled from a different line. Mm -hmm. So you filed with rural, you filed with HUA people know you filed because we're looking at FOIA requests and data but in the end, the green card was actually issued out of an entire different pile of visas anyway. So in the end, like, what does the I-526E filing data tell you if they're just going to pull it from the other numbers in the carryovers in order to get them out? So somebody here who's extremely astute, if you had someone that really knows all their stuff about EB-5 would say, well, hey, wait a minute. What about China and their carryover and their rights 
to the carryover because they have large uh, priority dates way back in 2015, 16, 17, 18. Let's talk about the, the, the actual practice, Greg, of how they issue visas and how there's actually a limit to what they physically can get out the door. Well, sure. If you were to look at, let's say, China as an example, then typically they are going to, um, they only have the bandwidth to knock out about six, seven, eight thousand uh, visas in a calendar year. And let's say they can even do 10,000. Well, there's 28,000 available. And the State Department knows that China's not going to be able to process 23,000 visas. And so what we are seeing as another example that I saw from Joey and Charlie is that they are allowing countries from rest of the world categories to get over the usual 7% allocation, even in the unreserved, and this could happen in the reserved uh, categories as well. So as an example, um, 7% of 23,000 is about 1,000. Vietnam is already getting about 1,200 visas given to them because the State Department knows China's not gonna use um, the entire inventory. And they have in the past, they've used a lot of it in the past, but what we're seeing this year is really exciting because the high demand uh, countries like India, Vietnam, Taiwan are gonna have access to additional visas beyond the the 7% that they would typically see when there's um, lower inventory. So the numbers are bouncing around unseen, unknown, and showing up in ways that we can't expect based off I-526 filing data from, you know, at the best, uh, September, October being the latest. And then even before that, even if it was an I-526E petition that was filed, it's not an I-526E HUA or rural green card in the end, because it might shift lines. So, you know, what, what do you do and how do you make decisions if you can't trust the data to be the same data six months from now when you're trying to file that petition today, looking backward? So when we're, we're talking about those visa carryovers and the ability for these lines to shift after the approval, the dual approval codes, mm-hmm. the, you know, the carryovers and then the arbitrary issuing of carryovers because... Well, there's just not enough manpower to get these visas out the door. So we'll just choose to send them out a different line and get that line done because they can actually physically do it. Um, so the, the arbitrary changes, does that change the calculus for the decision you should make today, just hopping in the I-526E filing line to start? So I think the biggest takeaway, Colin, is that some of what these sales pitches are saying is that if you do HUA, you're limited to 10% and you're probably not going to get processed for a couple of years. Um, that number is going to get lower over time. And then you only get 7% of that. And there's more than that available. Therefore you're in a hidden backlog. Um, and unfortunately people rush into this idea that rural is the only way forward. And it's just not true. Unfortunately for people who are saying that it's true, what we're seeing in reality is, you, IPO acting like a for-profit business and figuring out where to put all these visas above these categories, above these limitations. With carryovers and everything else, a lot more remains to be seen. But um, yeah. yeah, these sales pitches are, are pretty pretty daunting for somebody who's making an emotional decision, trying to figure out a visa problem for them and their family, who doesn't want to wait because they've waited long enough if they're in the United States. And the first thing that they hear is don't do HUA. It's going to take forever. And now they don't know how to figure out whether or not that's true. Yeah. So I I want to go to Peter on this. Um, As a lot of you that have followed us for years and years, you know, our history of litigation against USCIS. And when things get broken, Peter's the guy that goes in there and tries to fix it through the law. So looking at statute and actual law, that's all you can rely on in court. So if you bought a rural fast pass Mm -hmm. trying to get a green card, what can you enforce in court? What does it actually promise you where a judge will look at the law, look at USCIS and say, hey, this is what you should have done. You know, Peter, what does the law actually entitle you to here? Well, uh, it, it's unclear if it entitles to anyone to anything <laughs> in, this, in this specific instance. And, and it's, 
it's no fault of of USCIS. I mean, to, to be fair, what happened, and it's not unusual when when Congress passes a law, that's a political process. And and getting the Reform and Integrity Act took uh, seven years, uh, really, actually, since you know 20, 000, 2015. It, maybe even it, efforts started sooner than that when Congress wanted to make changes. So we saw uh, 32 extensions uh, between 20, 2015 and and and. Uh, 2022, when the Reform and Integrity Act was passed, and a five-year extension was given through 2027, and you know that's a political process. And what what Congress often does when they know that they're passing a leg, uh, a statute that's going to be implemented by a federal agency, here you know DHS USCIS, is that they they come together and get an agreement on something, and then they punt the rest and say you know. Let let the agency figure it out. You know, the, and and the agency is empowered to do this with with rulemaking, administrative process of of the administrative rulemaking process. But the key instance here is is you know what is priority processing, and and the only thing that was given in the Reform and Integrity Act is you know that um, USCIS shall prioritize the processing and adjudication of petitions in rural areas. That's it. Uh, there's no definition of priority, um, and it refers to processing petitions under two, Section 204A1H. And the, the really, the, the sole purpose, like what I'm trying to say here, is that it, it shouldn't be overly emphasized. Uh, and 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 some people are a little more aggressive, more or less aggressive on on selling what priority means. And it's a very different situation between an investor filing today than an investor filing a year ago. And we'll talk about that in a second. But just looking at the text itself, right, the law itself, what it says, what we do, what we know is um, that there's no definition. So there are certain things in the EB-5, or not, I, mean, I just mean in the Immigration and Nationality Act uh, that in immigration generally that have precedent, that have definition and a long history. And that would be premium processing, uh, expedited processing um, or expedited review. So these are things that are in the in the in the statute, in the history, in, in, in the practice that have specific precedent to it. They didn't use those words. They didn't use that terminology. And in statutory language, that words mean everything. And there is no definition. So Congress punted to USCIS, uh, presumably, to engage in rulemaking, to publish a notice of intent to, uh, for rulemaking, allow 60 to 90 day uh, uh, public comment period to give feedback on what this should mean and how this will be implemented. And to date, uh, you know, we're now March 2024, two years after the passage of the Reform and Integrity Act, and that's not been done. Um, so it. it it uh, also, I think we've seen some aggressive uh, marketing saying that uh, priority processing applies to the EAD, uh, the employment authorization document, the work permit, or advanced parole, or even the green card itself, the, the approval of the adjustment of status application. And that section of the statute refers to, um, um, to section 204A1H, which then refers to um, the EB-5 uh, section, where where if a person is seeking classification under Section 1153B-5, you know they can, you know they they're they're talking about pooling investments and so forth. So what that section is referring to is actually the I-526 petition and the I-526E petition. Nothing else. Uh, the I-45 is a different part of the statute. EAD advanced parole is a different part of the statute. Um, and we've seen in actual practice that uh, the EAD and advanced parole is approved in the same amount of time as it is for IHUA and for rural. There's no difference. Um, so just what don't want to overemphasize. Then, then there's some practical, practical aspects of this. Priority processing today isn't the same thing as priority processing last year, right? We've, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, there's been um, hundreds of applications, if not thousands, have filed in the rule um, based on this data. 
a person today can expect the same priority processing just based on if you were uh, priority processing last year. That's just the capacity of USCIS. Um, and it's not going to be to the exclusion of, of urban um, applications uh, because we've seen ourselves in, in our, our 1900 Broadway project, uh, HUA, an HUA project, uh, to have 956F and I526E approvals even before other rural projects out there. So it's not to the exclusion of urban HUA, and it's a very different picture today. Okay, so going deeper into that, like what I was mentioning before, if you were depending on that rural and you know some sort of priority processing to really speed things up and you tried to file a mandamus or a, a court case and you showed a judge like, hey, I paid for priority process and give it to me, they're gonna look at it and say, well, there's no law that actually says what that is. It was left from the statute, the real law, to turn into regulations, which would then maybe get guidance. And in that order, it's important. And the law, the most important one, does not describe and or entirely to really anything except for the thought of it should get priority. Then there's no regs because nobody's passed any regs post RIA. And then there's no guidance you know, because nobody's written down how do you prioritize it? Are, are they saying, well, we're going to do three priority positions for every one that's not? Is it two? Is it all of them? It doesn't say anything. Nobody knows. So what we've seen is evidence that also USCIS, the entire office, nobody knows because you get random type of approvals. You get random timing and some people are fast and some are completely ignored even since 2022. So if, if some people are completely ignored in summer three months, like, is that priority? Is that what you pay? And also, if you're today's filer, which is the big question, how does that line up behind the 1,000 previous filers and the, and the bulk majority? And I think it's 97% are still waiting. So that brings us to knowing this mess of calculus and the equation is just totally complicated where nobody's guaranteed anything, what do you do? You control the things you can control and forget about the rest because they're gonna happen on their own. And that brings us to this discussion of what can you control and what can you not? You know, Greg, you wanna just walk us through what those variables are? Yeah, so I mean, an uncontrolled variable being USCIS processing times, you know, you've got uh, a little bit of a delay coming out the gate post RIA as uh, USCIS had to get into implementation. We hope things speed up after they get uh, some new fees and, and some more cash uh, to be able to hire people. This can take some time to onboard train and then perhaps get through regs and policy um, information out to, to everybody. And that takes away from adjudication time to, to be able to use those resources to do it, approving projects as they come in. So uh, we've seen great variance in processing times. Uh, I don't know where it will normalize over the future, but if you see somebody get an approval in two months and somebody in 11, then you think, well, I'll, I'll probably get and get it in six months, but overall that's not true. So when you're using this small sample size data for processing times, it becomes a little bit scary and you should be when, when you're talking again work with your immigration attorney when you're talking about your immigration expectations and i think that you're going to see that most advisors would would take will tell you to take a cautious cautious approach like sure be hopeful but be careful because if you're doing this for speed and you don't get it are you going to be happy with your investment it, you, you know you have to really take a holistic approach here uh, visa availability with the carryovers and things expiring. Yeah, sure. We provided um, evidence of positive movement towards using all the unreserved visas uh, that could expire with reserve demand. We don't know how it will play out, uh, but these are, are positives. Um, I tend to be overly bullish about what IPO can do. I know those people, they're my friends, and I think that they're good, despite what everybody says about them and the frustrations that come with immigration filings. Um, but still a, a lot to be determined, at least until the end of this fiscal year, we're going to take a look at what information we have there. Right. So if we can't control 
the actual processing time. And we don't really know what the visa availability is because of the arbitrary decisions that are gonna take place between I-526 filed, approved, 485 and which dual approval code or, or non-reserve reserve, it all can change. USCIS and the Department of State really is gonna make that decision at the time the actual mm -hmm. visa is going out. So you might jump a couple different lines and different queues along the way whether you knew it or not. So ultimately, what does anybody really know on that, are, that is doling you a 100% sales pitch about this line being faster? It, you know, and as long as you, you know what you don't know, you can make a better decision. So the control variable, the things you do know, is that you do have control over your investment. You have control over your choice in the investment terms, which today got even stronger of control because now the sustainment period is no longer tied to your immigration process. You know, the sustainment period guidance came out that sustainment and the, the length of time that your investment is supposed to be at risk is a fixed amount of time from the moment that you the full commitment and $800,000 is placed at risk and the job creating project has nothing to do with the uncontrolled items which means your your the length of time your money is at risk is a choice. You get to pick. Is it shorter? Is it longer? That'll probably depend and those decisions will be made based on other factors that you want to consider, whether it's the type of investment, the asset itself, the availability, the uh, risk and returns, uh, the location, the, the duration of time that's appropriate for you based on personal circumstances. Can you afford one that's longer five years, seven years uh, of in, indefinite equity investment? Uh, or do you need something really fast? Are you, are you trying to get that timetable way down? The investment risk tolerance and the investment term all in your control. You get to pick. And the number one first thing you always had control of is your partners. You, you can pick who you want to work with. Who do you want standing next to you throughout this process? And with so many options and so much in the advertising world and so much noise out there, maybe that selection got a little blurry or not enough value because a lot of these projects all look the same. You know, you look, it's a construction deal. It's in a location. It's a category. It's a green card. It has relatively low returns for a lot of these debt style investments. They preach about all these approvals. They preach about security, but under the hood, if you were to really break this down and you had an absolute expert of those kind of assets sitting next to you, these projects are not even close to being the same. They're, like, they, they're on different planets from a financial perspective, financial underwriting, from a, a, an execution risk and development risk. Uh, and then from a financial perspective, they're gonna be all different. Just because their terms look the same and their, their little executive summary and the one page flyer might look the same, they're absolutely not. So talking about your partners, one of the things that we take a lot of pride in and one of the ways that you know Peter made happen and then one of the things that attracted Greg to wanna to work with a group like us is when things get really hard, what is your partner going to do for you? What, what are they, are they gonna be standing next to you trying to battle out bad policy? Are they gonna litigate USCIS when things go wrong and work on your behalf to make things better? Or are those partners just gonna turn their attention elsewhere and sell some other product they think makes money and just leave you on the shelf? Because there's definitely a certain number of those groups out there. Um, in the end today, based off what we've learned and our analysis of knowing what we know and what we don't know is that rural and HUA and any of the other reserve set-asides, we're all sitting against probably the same timelines we're all in the same buckets. That's because today's world, there's already a whole grip of filings that have vastly exceeded the quotas for China and India, and the rest of the world is climbing their way up, but they're getting put into different lines. All of a sudden, we become all in the same boat. Your processing times, your, your chance to get to a green card fast for today's filer, March 7th, 2024, not the first filers of 2022 or whatnot, because they really do have the priority dates that should have different timelines or whatnot. But after those quotas are exceeded, you know, here we are 
where everything is changing at a thousand miles an hour, but control what you can control and really just ride out the rest. And you might be pleasantly surprised anyway. So talking about the difference between policies and sales pitches, one, Peter just took us through statute and you know what is what is really promised to you in the law and then you know what is being sold and then what's the reality so for priority processing anybody that has a rural project is just heavily hanging their hat on it because they don't may or maybe don't have a whole lot else to brag about besides being rural 95 percent of the u.s land mass is rural it's pretty easy to find a rural project when it's almost everywhere you back out of a tea map and you look at the United States as a whole, I think it's uh, IIUSA's TEA map, the vast majority of the entire United States qualifies as rural. You can find a rural project anywhere you want. But the sales pitch is, this will get you a fast green card. Problem with that is the rural and even the language and the priority processing that we looked at here on the statute has nothing to do with green card. It only gets you a faster or a theoretical priority of I-526 processing, because if you look up the actual code, section 204A1H, that's only for I-526. It says nothing. And I think, uh, Go ahead. And I think, you know, just on this priority processing, like actual, you know, data, you know, last year you did see um, some I-526 petitions being approved uh, uh, faster for rule, um, but that it was only one or two projects uh, in the market at that time. And by the time we saw the high unemployment area projects being approved, you know, that differential between the two shrank um, to maybe about six months difference on average. <clears throat> and I think, you know, it, it depends. Uh, there, it's, there's a, you know, pros and cons to any approach to that. Uh, faster approvals, um, if there's a visa surplus, then it could it, it it you wouldn't see a backlog occur. If there if we are normal years and visas are going to waste and not being used, then a faster visa approvals could be um, you know lead to a faster retrogression in that in that category. There's just a lot of variables to you know that that impact all of this. And so, uh, but again, someone applying today when you have several hundred or a thousand petitions uh, ahead of you in rule, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get that same priority process that you got last year. That, I think that's the, that's the a key difference between uh, in, in terms of reality. Yeah. So <clears throat> going, you know, kind of back to that and, you know, the, the other sales pitches and things that people need to be able to see through knowing this data, is that a lot of people will say, well, you know, rural has twice the amount of set-asides. But in the end, like when we go back to the original data that we talk about, twice the amount of going from 28 to 56, when you're talking about needing, you know, a thousand, you know, here's the quota for per country versus what's filed. And then these, all these filings are going to move around anyway, jumping lines and moving so rest of world, rest of world goes to unreserved. Then there's more reserved, but it's based on priority date. But then that's capped by USCIS ability to get visas out the door. So then they start handing them to other countries anyway. Yeah. So like after you get through that spaghetti, then how should you make your decision? The fact that rural or somebody that's trying to pitch that rural is saying, but rural has 100% extra set asides, 20% instead of 10 it's like, but after the things that I just mentioned, 20 and 10 don't mean anything. If you need, you know, the difference between the numbers one and two mean nothing if you need 100. And then that 100 just gets scrambled around anyway on how it's doled out. So if you were to put it in writing and ask these, call it a rural project, put it in writing when I'm going to get my green card, they will absolutely not do it. And if they did, they're in trouble. They cannot promise you any of this. They can sell it and they can say, yeah, it could happen. They can put it in very, very 
very small fine print disclaimer text that they will not promise any of this actually happening. But the sales pitches are out there. You can see them in the emails, you know, very large cap letters in italics, you know, priority processing, get in front of the line. People are very good at trying to market the idea, but the truth is in reality, it just doesn't work that way. It gets really messy. Then uh, talking about processing times, that's uh, the, the whole item of old from the beginning of time, nobody's been able to pin down how, when, or if the processing times will even be within a certain window. You know, some of the, call it the lowest or like the, the most difficult filings we've ever had was approved in a magical 11 months when other people were 17 months, two years, whatever it might be. I have no idea why. So processing times are not promised to us. It's not in statute. Even though it was close, Peter, we were close. We had days and targets in the RIA. But then we never got the fee study. We never got the hiring. We never got progress after the, the law came out. And we still have it, right? Like we haven't seen it. We haven't seen the fee study. And until we get sure. that, and then they have the ability to hire, which who knows how long that's going to take, right. then we could take that RIA to the judge and say, where is my 90 day processing? So would you make different decisions knowing all of these items? And if you're from a high volume country, you have a little bit more of a trickier decision to make. China and India, for example, if you're from the rest of world, even though we know that Vietnam is already over uh, quota, we know mm -hmm. Taiwan is on their way to over quota. They have to make some decisions too. And what are your priorities? So if you're an investor today, you're already behind the you know, 1,000, 2,000 filings that are rural, HUA, and beyond. You, you have to make a decision today. And then knowing what we've just talked about and how that the calculus can change, what would you focus on? Control what you can control and, and focus on those variables? Or do you, you know, just focus on trying to navigate the... USCIS processing black hole and guess. There's nothing wrong with rural projects versus HUA. We just know priority isn't real today because it can't be for today's filer based on the numbers and or any predictable algorithm of mess that we just outlined on this slide that talks about what could happen to your calculus in the interim. This means that Anybody trying to guarantee when something's going to happen is wrong. So when we get back to like, what would I do? It really comes down to the grand answer on this entire chart for all of them is pick quality. Find a group that does what you want to do, has the right terms of investment. It hits your time horizon, hits your risk and return profile and partners that you want to be paired with for multiple years because those are the kind of people that you're going to need probably for a decade or so until that i829 and all the paperwork is totally able to be thrown in a trash can and never looked at again because you have your green card everything succeeded and you're done so outside the us you're not eligible for concurrent filing in a normal world if you're inside the us you really have a lot of choices. You can pick anything you want because of the concurrent filing with the EAD and the AP, the, the visa bulletin is current across the board. We showed that chart earlier, chart A. You have a lot of choices for everybody in order to get EAD, AP. If you're outside the United States, you have choices to control the speed to repayment. If you pick a project that's offering those shorter durations, three years, four years, five years, you can get your money back, have your job creation done, have your green card qualifications on a shelf, and then be patient and have your money back, but your green card will come in time. Fast, slow, long time, either way, it's coming. Your, your requirements are done, you have your money back. So that's something that you can control. Security, risk, risk returns, all the rest of the terms of an agreement, loan style, preferred equity, common equity, you can control that too. 
But focusing on what you can control and versus what you not, the end answer is just pick a really high quality project and that's gonna get you most of the way there anyway. Due diligence and how to pick that high quality project is an entire encyclopedia full of decisions and videos and handouts and charts and models that it's not gonna be done in this webinar. <laughs> so that's a whole different series. So for Peter and Greg, should we be opening up to Q&A? What do you believe is next year? Yeah, we should. I just want to point out also that with that data, we were able to take a look at, you know, who's been choosing us in the HUA market. And um, I, I think that we're doing pretty well for people who are able to file concurrently, who see the quality that you just mentioned. They're, they're able to come out and see this beautiful tower being rented out. Leases are getting signed this week. It's ready to capture some income. We've got the RISE fund already cash flowing. Yeah. One project already built, five more being delivered now. There's a lot of excitement to be part of something that's institutional grade, diversified, quicker to get in, quicker to get out of. You're not out in the mountains betting against global warming, hoping it snows every year and the, and the slopes stay open. You're not competing in flooded markets in places like Florida, Atlanta. You're, you are in one of the best markets in the world in terms of the future for the technology, uh, jobs. CEOs are coming back to the Bay Area. You, we can't just take the opportunity to speak to our customers and not mention this. Um, but yeah, the data is definitely supported. Uh, the, uh, we, if you look at the number of filings overall and look at how many are coming through bearing, we're doing pretty well. Yeah. And, you know, like for the RISE project and a lot of you uh, are current friends and investors and people that we already know, uh, the report card of bearing for the last six months has had the most milestones that we've ever hit in this facet duration, delivering six assets in six months. So uh, throughout the rest of this year, all the way to September 2024, we're going to have almost half of our portfolio for RISE open. Construction jobs banked, projects open, cash flowing and renting. And then we have you know, seven or eight more projects that are coming after that that are new jobs, more capacity for more investors who can see the first half already done and hop into an open EB-5 investment where they get to benefit for our entire body of work that was already done. And for the RIA and being able to get the shorter sustainment period, three-year debt deals that are available, this is the best and only way you can do it because by having 14 projects in a portfolio, 11 of them EB-5 job qualifying. Effectively, they're all small projects and modular. It's just one extra project at a time. It makes it so easy to control the duration of when investors come and exit. We have been able to engineer a, a program that easily fits three-year repayments because you have lots of projects ending in cash flowing and refinancing even way before that the last investors are even entering the projects. So with RISE, this financial model and having operating cash flow and refinances and project exits that have this much capital and the financial resources of the sponsor having a $220 million capital commitment into each of these diversified across 14 properties, this is unparalleled in EB-5. Other projects, you know, there's nothing wrong with the rural category on the surface or other HUA categories or locations. But when you really are invested in one asset, one project, one thing goes wrong, everything is dependent on that issue. You're not diversified. If you were ever sit in a finance class or a business or economics class, they talk about diversification as being like the number one rule of not going broke. Because if you have all your eggs in one basket, they can all crack. This is to handle that. And for EB-5, not even from a financial safety perspective, but from a schedule perspective, and also uh, from you know, the job creation and being able to repay quickly, having it being modular where you have multiple phases and they're all ending in different times, 
it's all you know uh, scaled out. This is different, and that's why we did this. This is the right choice for this market today, and you know now with processing times being what they're being, and uh, the whole you know rural versus HUA discussion is now closed. There is no difference. There, everybody is facing the same situation for today's filer. You've got to make a decision on quality. So for individuals that are interested, if you want to learn more about RISE and our current funds and our, our current uh, opportunities, uh, being able to talk directly with Greg, Peter, and the rest of the team, uh, myself included, if you want to uh, sign up for the virtual tours where you can actually see the 14 assets in action, yeah. uh, we're putting out those videos too. Um, everything from UC Berkeley student housing, Jack London Square, you know, value add projects, Emeryville, four minutes from Pixar Animation's headquarters, more housing. Uh, we're, we're really proud of this stuff. We, we love it. So uh, happy to share those opportunities and happy to talk about it. But we will open up the floor now and start going to the Q and A uh, for you know anybody that has questions. Yeah, and Peter and Greg, you guys see any questions out there? You're yeah, more than welcome to jump on it. Yeah, I've been trying to get to some of these questions, but. Um... One one quick question, just uh, that I think is important for the the group, um, is uh, again the carryovers and and you know if a set aside and rule, for example, um, you know what happens to the visas that are unused after um, the country uh, quota cap? Um, you know, are they given? You know, who, how how do those unused reserve visas? get uh, get applied to countries like um, China and India with, that have higher demand. And my understanding is that uh, unused visas, uh, unused reserve visas in that fiscal year would be allocated to those countries uh, with demand based on priority date. Um, the interesting thing, and we'd have to see the numbers about um, um, the filing statistics again for country specific like China and India and so forth, but it is a little bit different than in years past. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, years past where early EB5, 2013, 2014, 2015, you know, China was 90, 95% of the entire market. And so the, um, as such, China occupied, had the earliest prior dates and occupies much of the use of the carryover visas. Um, today, going forward, it's a little bit more diverse. Good Peter sec there. Yeah, and, and you know, Peter's also mentioning, you know, going through, uh, you know, the, the carryovers and having those visas get issued, but then having those channels change where priority date is kind of on the surface what uh, right. the first people to get it. So if you had uh, historically, you know, right now the numbers are that China has a lot of backlog where there are visas still from 2016, 17, 18, still waiting. They theoretically would get the, the carryovers and get those issued. But as Greg mentioned, the, the, the consulate is limited to the amount of visas that can physically shove out the door. As soon as the Department of State realizes that they're kind of hitting their physical capacity, and this is done on a quarterly basis. Thank mm -hmm. you, Greg. And uh, Greg's insight from being a former USAS adjudicator, every quarter that progress is measured and the Department of State decides, okay, visas are going out to these countries. Yeah, like we're, we're, we're getting these out the door. This is where they're going. It is a arbitrary decision that they make based on what they know, and they are trying to get the most visas they can out the door to avoid wastage. More visas, more fees, more revenue for the agency. Keeps them in business. They're able to pay their bills. They're a fee-based agency in the government. So they need to get visas out if they know that China is just not going to be getting more than X visas. They shove visas out in other lines. So all of a sudden the calculus changes. 
right? right. The carryovers go, to, you know, kind of like water, it's going to find level. Yeah, it will. You're right. And so I, I think if you have, if you look at, you know, data analysis and what's available in rural versus HUA in this year, you could probably forecast that some of those will not get used and would flow up to the unreserved generalist stockpile. So they don't like go back down to rural to be used again, but they can be used to service demand uh, based on uh, priority date, whether or not if it's overseas, if somebody's ready to actually capture the visa or with it, if it's adjustment of status, somebody gets an unreserved code, just happened, uh, even though they applied for a rural investment. So like you said, Colin, they got to find a way to find homes for these visas. And they are doing things that they, they put in the works years ago for seeing this exact scenario. Yep. Agreed. Uh, so to, to go to some of the other questions, we have some good stuff here. Uh, as far as the questions, uh, one, you know, some due to asking, you know, what happens if I'm still waiting for an I-526 even after I've completed the exit term of a project. So if you got repaid and you pulled your money out of a deal and you're still waiting for an I-526 approval, no problem. The, the new guidance and the new sustainment period wants you to be invested 100% at risk, $800,000 into the project for a minimum two years. That is the guidance as it's understood today. There are a few people that believe that there that might be not 100% and not law. And like, there's a couple attorneys out there that are questioning the item. But if that guidance sticks, as it reads in plain English, uh, you could theoretically take your investment back after your sustainment period is done, after your investment commitment that's in your documents and the offering, after that's completed, you could be repaid. And whatever the immigration process is, will be independent of you getting repaid. It won't affect you. You can get your money back and be done. You And then your job creation's done. Make sure you have all your documents from your regional center showing your, your job creation, everything that you want for an IA29, your path of funds. You wanna see the receipts of your money going out, coming back. You need everything that you need to show USCIS in the future. Don't let your regional center off the hook by repaying you unless you have all your documents in place. Um, some regional centers are not gonna be around forever. They're going to close their doors someday. Some of us will be around for multiple decades, but others, you know, it's, it's a one and done project, right? There's some people that are EB-5 enthusiasts. They're not dedicated lifetime professionals. Uh, so your choice and partner is really important for that question. Uh, but yes, the I-526 and repayment, totally separate tracks and not dependent on each other. Yeah, and just a little insight from USCIS, the sustainment period also helps to promote economic growth with smaller projects. Like historically, these larger projects that could take multiple years to get built and deliver were just swallowing up the EB-5 uh, demand. And so we're, we're seeing, uh, you know, government policy wants rural, they want smaller projects. The sustainment period is friendly for those options. And where you have something like RISE that's basically tailored to intercept both, uh, you know, demand strategies and provide that to, to give people multiple exit options with diversified uh, investment choices as well. It's really, you know, we are on the cutting edge of this. People love to copy up us, whether and I can go into, you know, the ways that we've set the mold for EB-5, but we're continuing to do it again. One question that we have is, um, What's the relationship with the 956F and I-526E approvals? And I think this is an interesting question because the statute doesn't require the 956F to be approved before an I-526E investor petition is approved. Um, and in fact, uh, before the RIA, it was very common for the I-526 petition to be approved or multiple investor petitions to be approved before uh, what then was called the I-924 project exemplar to be approved. Um, and in fact, it wasn't even required to be filed. And I think USCIS did a good thing by, or I should say Congress, did a good thing by requiring the filing of the 956F because it forces more projects to get you know, more and more quality, less and less hypothetical. And that's what pre-RIA could, you know, they could have a lot more projects or a lot more hypothetical and just a business plan. And, and now by having forcing the filing 
of a 956F requires those projects to be shovel ready, be much you know closer to to reality, or even under construction already, even better. Um, but uh, in practice, this past year, and 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 again, we're only seeing you know there's only a there's not that many projects uh, um, out there uh, post RIA. Um, and and we have, I think, what, what is it, Greg? Like 250 uh, I-956, uh, I-956F petitions pending, uh, somewhere around yeah. there. As of September. So a lot yeah. of projects uh, uh, filed uh, in, in recent months. Um, but it, 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 in recent months, we've seen that the 956F is approved, and then the 526 petitions are being approved thereafter. That might be the practice. It's, there's no rule about this, and that wasn't the practice historically. Um, for example, our, our next year on Broadway, when we had the 956F approved, within three weeks, we started getting the I-526E approvals um, uh, for that project. So that may be the practice, um, um, but I don't know if, that, if that's going to be the trend going forward, it, or if it's going, you know, as more 956Fs get into the queue, then USCIS will start reviewing, uh, um, you know, I five two six petitions, and it'd be like what we saw in years past. I can we, uh, we we were going to talk, uh, maybe not in this uh, webinar, but in a future webinar, maybe we'll focus or we'll do a video on it about what is the nine five six F, what is USCIS looking at, and and that it's not a major hurdle that that. Um, that you may might think it is, uh, you know. In short, USCIS is just looking at the the uh, business plan and the job report and and looking ahead, looking in the future, and looking prospectively and, and making a determination that the business plan, the project's business plan, is credible, and that the project will reasonably likely create the jobs that it says it will. And that's what they're looking for: credibility. Uh, and and so with quality projects, quality uh, uh, regional centers, the 956F is not, is not really a hurdle. Um, sorry, Greg, you were about to say. No, I was going to say that um, the forms that came in were basically a lot of uh, re-registrations of current projects. Like in our case, we basically had to take the already approved 1900 funds and then redo the 956F. So post RAA, I think as a starting point, they started to get more projects that they could handle. I don't think that by next year there's going to be 500 pending projects. I think that they are going to get caught up to process through them because doing that helps to make sure that 526Es get approved. Um, so th that's something we're certainly watching. Okay. Uh, going on to a subsequent question here. Uh, people are asking, you know, does Bering offer senior loan? options. And then uh, another question is, you know, what is the senior loan? Uh, senior loans, uh, very quickly in finance, is just being really what is simply a construction loan. You are a lender, you have a borrower, you're in the first position, you're the first person to get repaid once the project is finished. A mezzanine loan is typically behind the senior lender, and there's a second one to get paid, they get a higher interest rate, uh, but they they have to wait for the first position to get repaid, and then all the money goes to them. So senior loans, in theory, in regular practice, should be higher safety, higher priority and repayment, but the devil's in the details. So we have seen deals where there's a senior loan or the EB-5 is in first position, right? But there are conditions to when that is getting repaid. And that might have to wait five years, seven years, or even after the sustainment period is done. And then pre-RIA, that could have been five years, seven years, or forever if you're in a Chinese backlog. The senior loan had to wait for all of that stuff. And the equity holders who theoretically in a normal banking scenario by JP Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, Fortress, somebody that's offering loans, they would theoretically get paid first, but in these drafted documents that are drafted specifically at EB-5 and EB-5 being the senior lender, in order to attract that investment, the loan document itself might have holes in it that say, oh, the developer can take money back. The developer can cash flow all this stuff because the EB-5 investors have not 
reach their sustainment period. There's a lot of ways to design little rabbit holes out the back. So it really depends on your documents. But in theory, a senior loan should be better than mezzanine loans as far as repayment. It's higher priority than preferred equity normally. And especially it should be higher priority than common equity, but it gets a very low interest rate. So does Bering offer projects that have senior loans? Yes and no. When I go back to RISE, this is a portfolio loan investment, 14 assets. The vast majority of these are planned on being mezzanine loans. We're in the second position. But as we get later in the portfolio, there's a chance and a plan that we're going to end up being the first position stretch senior loans because the capital is available. The projects are starting construction. And we, yes, on some of the smaller projects, if the whole senior loan and mezzanine position we would have had as EB5 was small anyway, we might as well service the senior position and the mezzanine loan uh, be because of our position already in the deal. So that in that case, we would be the senior lender for every you know, single asset opportunities and specific ones that we want to take on. Senior loans can be lower risk. It all depends on the document. It all depends on the loan itself. It also depends really on the borrower and the target asset. In this situation, I would much rather have a repayment guarantee and a corporate repayment guarantee from RIAS Capital and their equity investment funds, which is hundreds of millions of dollars backing this portfolio of diversified multifamily investments across the San Francisco Bay Area, some being UC Berkeley student housing, others being value add existing buildings that are just being turned into apartments. You have inherent value. If six of those assets are already done in cash flowing, that cash is more security than a senior loan because the actual proven value means that any loan is going to get repaid based off its performance. So the devil's in the details and you want a partner that can see those details and show you what you're really up against. In theory, all things being equal, A versus B, senior loans are good but I would rather have a, a mezzanine loan with completed assets in it, cash flowing and a corporate guarantee secured by 14 different assets than a single senior loan on a rural project in the middle of nowhere that it may or may not make any money. It might not, might not even complete. If it doesn't complete, but well, here's the next part. If you're the senior lender, nobody is coming to rescue you. It's just you, you're on your own. If you are the senior lender to a hotel in the snowy mountains somewhere, if that developer decides not to finish their project and they throw the keys at you and say, good luck, EB-5 investor, you are the senior lender. I wish you the best with this unfinished project. What are you going to do with it? You know, you're like a dog chasing a car. You know, you bite the wheel and then what? Yeah, yeah, you, you've got it yourself to a half-finished hotel in the middle of nowhere. Go, go pay to finish it. You took, you knew the job was dangerous before you took it. You wanted to be the senior lender, the big money bags. Now you need to go finish the project. That's where being a vertically integrated developer comes in because we can actually finish the project. We actually can step in, build it, get some money back, and recover our capital. If you're just an EB-5 regional center with no developers, no experience, no construction, no money, then what are you going to do as a senior lender foreclosing on an asset you don't want in a place you don't work with no expertise to actually finish it? Do you want to be the senior lender in that standpoint? Because they're not going to get your money back anyway. So the devil's in the details. Pick partners that can navigate this stuff and get you out of trouble. That's the key. So uh, that was a long-winded answer to probably what should have been a really simple question. But yes, we are looking at senior loan opportunities, uh, but there are a lot of different ways to mitigate risk at the same time. Next question. I have a question Brett, that talks about, um, you know, that the EB-5 program is set to end in 2027. Mm -hmm. And this, and we didn't, uh, we mentioned this in the agenda, we didn't really, um, uh, go into detail on this. So I think it's a good question to, to raise, you know, what do we expect to happen in or, or after 2027? 
uh, is there any chance the quotas might change as a result? So I, I think these are all good questions. Um, the, the couple of important dates you know, going forward is that the EB-5 uh, Regional Center Program is was extended for five years uh, through um, uh, September 30th, 2027. And um, and so at that time, USC, or Congress needs to pass legislation to um, renew at that time. And I, and I think there's an opportunity for, for legislative change, but it's hard, right? Uh, and it, there's always this political inertia. Um, and as many, many folks on the call today are, you know, know painfully well in terms of how difficult it is to get immigration reform uh, you know, especially in the H-1B, EB-2, EB-3 backlog, uh, country caps and, and all that, you know, that that bills keep being uh, proposed every year, but just barely, you know, almost never get out of committee. Um, so there is a political inertia from Congress where they're going to view uh, EB-5 saying, well, uh, didn't we solve that in, in 2022? And, and so it, it's kind of hard. And that's why anytime there's momentum and and, um, um, and and folks like um, um, uh, IIUSA and EB5 uh, Investment Coalition will say like when when there is political will you have to kind of use that momentum and, and do what you can to get it at that time because it's it's very hard to move Congress to do something and and that's my concern in, in 2027 is that they're going to do the same uh, I thought we solved this already. On the other hand, if we can show what has worked and what has not worked in, in, in these five years, I think the country quota uh, or the, the uh, set, visa set aside is probably going to be the best opportunity to talk about that. Um, the country caps are so small uh, in this. And, and while uh, Senators Grassley and, and, and uh, Leahy from Vermont and, and well, uh, Iowa and Vermont, respectively, um, you know, were so adamant in, in in pressing for this, but they they did create inherent problems uh, by strong arming uh, uh, this with these small con uh, uh, country caps. Um, one other uh, important date is that um, in Congress's infinite wisdom, they put the cutoff for grandfathering protection. A year earlier. So what they're saying is basically, if you file an EB-5 petition before uh, September 30th, 2026, uh, uh, honor before September 20th, 30th, 2026, you are grandfathered. Meaning, if Congress decides not to renew EB-5 in 2027, USCIS still must adjudicate your petition, and they can't deny your petition just because the program expires. This is to prevent all that nonsense that occurred uh, um, in, in, in 2021 and where we filed a lawsuit uh, in, in relations uh, to, these, to, the, to that nonsense and were successful in, that, in large part. Um, and, uh, but for, what, for whatever silly reasons, Congress uh, you make, you know, it effect, it's essentially forcing you to, to file before 2026 to have that protection. Um, to against a, a termination of the program. Now, personally, I don't think you know the amount of economic stimulus that that the EB-5 program brings to U.S. communities and creating U.S. jobs is tremendous. And I and I just don't think Congress will ever stop the program. It's just a matter of what kind of pain we have to suffer to get those continue you know, extensions. Um, so I think I, I'm, I'm confident that there will be extended in 2027. Of course, if you file before October 1st, 2026, you're going to be protected uh, from that. Whether we're going to see substantive changes, like high on that list would be giving parole to overseas investors so that they can come into the country and and start their start their lives in the united states start their american dream you know get you know get an ead um be able to live and work and study in the united states as they wish so getting parole into the united states for overseas investors is is probably the top priority for 
for all investors that participate in the EP5 program. This was a proposal in the original drafts um, in 2022. It didn't make the cut. Um, and I and I know that's 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 high on the list. Um, increasing the visa numbers um, and and by extension these quotas would also be high priority. But it's a uh, um, as any of the EB5 stakeholders will tell you, it's very hard to get this through. So uh, on top of that, though. It might not mean a whole lot to everybody on this call today because we're looking at trying to file and get this started, but we are in a completely different world in the eyes of the public and Congress when we're talking about when we were trying to pass the RIA and just how, how, how debatable or how you know conflicted this project in EB-5 was. There's so many people arguing about, oh, well, it's full of fraud. You know, is it good for you know the United States immigration? And should people be buying green cards, whatever it might be? When we go back in 2026, 27, we show what EB5 has done. It is just utter wins for the US. We, we, we are just creating so many jobs and doing so many good projects. And we don't have any of the noise and the baggage that came with the last legislative cycle, not to mention Senator Leahy has retired. He's gone. Then you've got Senator Grassley, who is retiring on a daily basis. And so like the 2026-7 legislative cycle is going to face an entirely different narrative about how do we expand this program? How do you let this horse run? How do we actually really get the most value out of EB-5 and I, I just I feel like it's going to be a completely different attitude when that comes. But that doesn't really affect the people that are standing here today and people that would absolutely be grandfathered in and these projects all well and done before that happens anyway. So but I do want everybody to, to know, like, there is a massive positive tailwind to EB-5 and this whole program going into the next legislative cycle anyway. Uh, talking about uh, some of these questions that I said I definitely would get to, um, you know, talking about, you know, individuals that are rest of world right now happen to be out of Canada. This is a specific question, you know, born in India, but in Canada, you know, what are you thinking about EB-5 in the route today? Born in India, living in Canada you're still going to have Indian chargeability for all intents and purposes. You're Indian and the visa Bolton being what it's being, you know, that right now it's, it's current, but being outside the country, you're not exactly eligible for concurrent filing or AP. Uh, you're, you're going to be in the normal processing times. So really, if you are comfortable now and you're flexible on your time schedules for EB five, and you know that you want to live in the United States in the future, you want to broaden uh, broaden your ability to earn in the U.S. is what we typically hear, right, guys? You know, I want to broaden my professional opportunities, children's education, stuff like that. You know, if you know you want to be here, you should file EB-5 knowing you're working toward it. You know, it, it's going to come. You're going to get your green card eventually, no matter what. When is a moving target because of everything that we said on this webinar since 2 o'clock p.m.? It's going to be a moving target. Good immigration attorneys will probably label this at a couple of years process, plus or minus, trying to figure out when exactly everything pl plays out. But the key is you're going to get a green card eventually. It's just a matter of when. If you're somebody that is trying to pin the tail on the donkey and you're trying to get a green card by a specific date, all of these categories are going to disappoint you because they're just not going to hit a specific date. It's going to work. And then the other good thing is, you can invest and get your money back. There's projects where the, the, the fixed duration and the repayment term has nothing to do with the immigration process. You can get repaid. Which one's going to be faster? Right now, we believe today's filers, especially from India, you're going to be in the same boat, whether it's rural, HUA, or otherwise. So quality of project and prioritizing repayment and getting out of the project financially, you can control those things. You cannot control the speed at which you're going to be approved or issued that green card specifically. However, there is 
a chance that we'll be able to identify those processing times in the future if USCIS finishes the fee study, if USCIS hires the resources, then the RIA mandate of 90 days, 180 days, and I think uh, it was 829s or two, 270 days. Was that right? Um, yeah, Something like that. Those, those statute, statutory times, they, they would kick in after that point. Peter and I were optimistic the day the RIA was passed that they would actually do the fee study. Unfortunately, they just, they just didn't. <laughs> yeah, they, the fee study gave us hope, and then they took it away. Let so, me just add to the, uh, the response to that question. We get calls from people in the United States who are using the Canadian citizenship to uh, use like the E2 visa or TN. They might be on L1, and um, country of birth determines how your visa is actually processed, but. Uh, those with Canadian citizenship, despite where they're born, do have uh, and do use these other visas to to entertain EB-5 while they're working in other capacities in the United States. And by the time they approach us and say, I want to do EB-5, um, they can do the concurrent filing. They can capture child status protection. They can get the EAD for their kids here. And it, it's a question that comes up a lot, which is... Um, naturalized Canadian, born in India, what are my options? And it really depends on where you are, when you file. Yeah. Yeah, so again, moving targets, guys, it's not a sales pitch, it's just, it's a reality because of the reasons we mentioned where the calculus changes at multiple times throughout the entire duration life cycle of EB-5. So anybody trying to sell EB-5 to a specific project, to a specific person, they can't do the math based on what we have shown you. They just, they, if they're picking a date on when you're gonna have a green card, you just shouldn't talk to that person anymore. Like, because just, they can't. So it can speed up and mandamus actions. Again, I don't think we even talked about the mandamus actions and how much of that can change what's going on. So, I mean, Peter and Greg, if you guys wanna to touch on that, where, today's filers and I uh, call it even not even today but like let's call it 22 and 23 at what point are they looking at mandamus actions to close the gap on timing yeah it's going well, to be um, things the process petition yeah I, I think it depends on which petition and and um well frankly uh where they're located so the the mandamus uh just for a summary um, um, or definition uh, to catch everyone up. Mandamus is a, a, a lawsuit, basically. You're, you're suing USCIS in federal court, and you're basically complaining to the court that USCIS is not doing its job. It's taking too long. It's an uh, um, uh, unfair, inordinate delay uh, in the processing of your, your, your application, your petition. And um, there have been several lawyers uh, spearheading this and been quite successful. Uh, Matt Galati being, being one, um, KLD, another, and others um, uh, that have successfully have been successful with um, mandamus strategy. Um, in the, it's different though if you're inside the United States or outside the United States, and um, uh, whether you're filing as an individual, or you're filing in a group, and and so some courts are more or less sympathetic to, uh, and I, it's not, uh, that's not the right word, but more or less sympathetic to uh, um, investors uh, than to uh, USCIS. So some courts are, are very deferential to USCIS, like the uh, uh, District Court of Columbia um, Federal Court there is, is it, it hasn't been as successful strategy as it has been in years past. Um, at, at least as for the I-526 petition. So in, in years past, if you have been waiting for a year to two years, um, filing a mandamus um, was uh, largely successful. I think that's been changing and, and, uh, uh, lately, at least at the uh, DC court, which is where most uh, overseas investors must file. And, um, but um, I'm not as familiar with uh, the success rates or the frequency of filing at the I-45 stage, but 
at the eight through nine stage, we have been seeing some uh, some good success. And that is a different situation because there's already language in the statute that says that USCIS should respond to these eight through nine petitions in 90 days. And I think that's the hook, that's the anchor. And so we've had some investors in our own uh, previous projects um, who filed mandamus actions for their IA29 petitions. And uh, within, you know, within, I think, 60 to 90 days after uh, filing those, um, I would say maybe 60 to 120 days within filing those mandamus actions, their A29s were approved. So I think that may still be a viable strategy. I do, uh, I, I am hopeful that um, the fee study will will be implemented. I don't think they're going to totally disregard it. I think USCIS is just inundated with a variety of mandates. This is being one of them, and and so that uh, we don't know where they are in that process. The 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 fee increase that it takes effect across all visas, including EB five, uh, that takes effect on April first, is not related to the fee study. USCIS has has expressly stated that this is unrelated. So the it, uh, if if you're not aware already, on April first. Um, USCIS will raise fees across all visas. Um, USC, uh, EB-5 just takes the brunt of it, the highest, some of the highest in, increases by 200 plus percent. So the I-526 petition, for example, will increase from $3,675 to something like $11,160. Um, the A-29 will have a similar rate of increase. I think it, it's gonna be over $9,000. Uh, for the 829 petition. Um, so there are there are several uh, investors uh, trying to file before um, the April 1st date. And I think that you know may cause an uptick in, in filings. I, uh, we'll see how it's going to take some time before we know what those numbers are and, and whether that's going to have future impact on on demand and, and supply. It's another factor to take into consideration. I don't think it's going to be as tremendous a bubble as 2019 or or even 2021. You know when it was 500,000 for seven days as a result of our lawsuit. Um, it's just that an $8,000 fee increase in the grand scheme of things is is not cause to rush when choosing where to place your money, of life savings of $800,000 uh, in a project for three to five years. Um, so I, I think there will be an uptick, but it won't be as major. I think that was uh, that was a question that someone had asked in this, in this uh, 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 earlier today. Yeah. Well, but I should say um, about the fee study um, too, and, I, and you know, again, uh, a, a shout out and the thanks to Matt Galati, um, uh, the AIA, AIA group, uh, Suzanne Lazicki, uh, you know, in terms of her ability to uh, unpack a lot of this detail. Um, she does a great job at the Lucid Text blog. Um, Charlie Oppenheim, Joey Barnett, uh, they've also been able to help unpack and, and decipher a lot of this. And Charlie does a great job, kind of like Greg, you know, a little bit of inside baseball, right? Greg can give. Uh, uh, insight uh, into the operations of, of USCIS. Uh, Charlie does a great job, you know, sh sharing his experience and expertise on from the State Department. Um, and so these FOIA requests are 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 great, and it helps to raise transparency in in this industry. And and we just need more of it. And as a, as a result, I think it's good to continue to put pressure on on USCIS and, and even the State Department for that matter, until more and more information, these, these become more automatic uh, self-reporting mechanisms by USCIS. So to that end, uh, we are uh, preparing our own FOIA uh, request here shortly, um, trying to get more recent uh, numbers um, here as of March, um, but we're also gonna be trying to tackle policy-related questions and try to raise transparency on some of these issues that we've, that we've raised today. Priority processing, how is it defined? How is it implemented? Um, dual visa codes, 
how is that uh, implemented? Is it uh, self-implemented by USCIS or the Department of State, like Greg has recently seen, or is it just you know uh, investor choice? Um, uh, and, and so, and, and, and other policy related questions that will, this will take time, this will take a few months uh, for us to, to, to implement, but it is definitely um, Bering's um, direction. Yeah, and we'll be doing a lot more active on that FOIA front. Um, we have questions that are not answered by uh, other groups that have, you know, whether what happened to be Macalani's uh, work or the the other FOIAs, uh, we we have our own questions, and we're going after those items that are important to us, asking about policy, procedure, other things in the inner workings of USCIS, and uh, if we get those answers along with more recent filing data, we'll have better insights as to some of these variables that we believe are outside our control. But if we understand how they work. Uh, that will give us uh, an even better chance of trying to identify some of these pinch points and give better guidance. So uh, we're going to be much more active on requesting this data and then mining that data for good insight to help investors make better decisions. So uh, that's definitely on our plate and our roadmap for 2024 and beyond. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of FOIA requests. So um, outside of that, guys, now, are there more questions that we want to answer? And if there's anybody else out there where we missed you, uh, throw your question back in there at the bottom of this chat uh, so we can make sure we answer it. So uh, otherwise, you know, we've put in almost two hours. Uh, happy to help here. I hope you guys found this informative and useful. Uh, and if anything, uh, left here with a better grasp on what's going on in the EB-5 world. And also what's not going on. I think that, you know, when we talk about the competition between the rural players that are out there, they're all fighting each other. They're trying to, to figure out the best deal and give it to somebody who's looking at EB-5 for the first time. And when, when you talk to your great partners, whether it's a great regional center like us or great attorneys, you have to take some time and figure out what's true, what's not. And like you said, control what you can. Okay. If there are no more questions that we see pile in here, uh, Peter, thank you very much. Greg, thank you very much. Uh, everyone on the Bering team that put all the decks together and got the information and mining all the data. Uh, hugely appreciative. And for everybody that stayed on for this long call, uh, we hope you found it helpful and we hope to talk to you all very soon. So thank you very much.